God cannot lie He promised to save His people He never changed His mind Today He still calls them my people My people, my people Well, hi there and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Yes, we welcome you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. We're continuing on in our study of the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And again, to see the things that are pleasing and the things that are displeasing to the Lord. Yes. For it is our desire to know those things. Yes, Hallelujah. It is. Uh, this, I believe, is our 17th part of the study. Mm. We're in the, the uh, fourth letter, the letter to the church at Thyatira. Mm hmm and we were in that last week, so we're going to pick up where we left off, and I think we're going to pick up at uh, in verse 23. Right. Chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 23. But before we do that, I just want to ask the Lord, yes. that Father, that you, would, that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things mm -hmm. in your word. We thank you that you sent yes. your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, mm -hmm. and that you have put that very same Holy Spirit within us. Thank you, Lord. So Father, just... Just open our ears, dig out our ears, that we would hear the voice of your Son, Jesus Christ, as he speaks to these churches, knowing that he's speaking to us in this day. Yes, Lord. We just praise you and thank you, Lord, that you have called us by name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Let's go. Let's go. That's a good idea. Let's go. Revelation chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 23, reading to the... Alex, why don't you just read that verse? Okay. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. All right, her being Jezebel, mm -hmm. who calls herself a prophetess. Yes. And we covered that in uh, last week, we, I think maybe even the last two, two sessions, sessions that we've had, so you can go back and watch those here on Bible Talk. But we were talking about, as we closed last week, we were talking about generational curses, mm -hmm. what they are, uh, what effect they have, and how their effect, any effect that they do have can be easily broken. Yes. So you may want to go watch that, yes. right? So here in verse 23, what we left off was talking about that all the churches will know that I am He who searches the minds and the hearts. Yes. Okay? The Lord searches the mind. Well, He investigates is really... Uh, uh, Kind of what that Greek word there implies. He's investigating. But actually what he says literally is that will he, invest, he will investigate or search the kidneys. Mm -hmm. The kidneys, you say. <clears throat> the word that's translated mind uh, here and reigns, by the way, in the King James Version is actually the Greek word nephros, which means kidney. kidney. Now, that sounds like a very strange thing to say, that you're going to search the kidney. It does sound like a strange mm -hmm. thing. And I think because it sounds strange to the natural mind, mm -hmm. that when God talks about searching us, that he would search the kidneys, I think this is the reason that, that it's basically been interpreted or translate, in, interpreted. It's not a translation, because if it were a translation, it would say kidney. Right, right? exactly. Because that's literally and exactly what it says in mm -hmm. the original Greek. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what happens is, in an effort to make it easier to read or understand, quote unquote, people who are writing these versions of the Bible change that word to mind, because they understand in the natural how God would check to see what's going on in your head, because after all we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But God has a purpose for the words that he speaks. Absolutely. And it says, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy and said that every, every all Scripture, every word of this Scripture is God-breathed. It has life in it, right? Mm -hmm. Why would God say that he searches the kidneys? Well, and, and by the way, in the Latin, the word for kidney is ren, where the King James gets the word rain. R-E-I-N. Okay. Yes. And that's what it is in the, in the King James, yes. Mm -hmm. Um but I said it's the word nephros, and if you, if you were to do a study, and remember, go, go to your encyclopedia and you look at the word nephro, or kidney, you'll see the word nephros all through it. Mm -hmm. Because that's a term that is still used today in all kinds of medical terminology, right? right? The kidneys are, and I'm reading from the encyclopedia now, okay. right? 
The kidneys are bean-shaped organs that serve several essential regulatory roles in vertebrate animals, of which you are one. <laughs> that right? sounds... We're vertebrates, yes. yes. They remove excess organic molecules like, like glucose mm -hmm. from the blood, and it is by this action that their best known function is performed, the removal of waste products of metabolism. All right? It's a filtering agent. Yes. They serve the body, the kidneys serve the body as a natural filter of the blood and remove wastes. Mm. Now, remember the context of this. Think about this. Mm -hmm. The church has a woman within it called Jezebel yes. who is teaching the body, whoever will listen, right? Mm -hmm. Teaching them to, she's teaching them immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. In other words, she is teaching them filth. Waste product. And God is looking at the kidney to see if that filth is being passing through and being filtered out in our lives. Exactly. How does it get filtered out? Well, with the Word of God. Amen. It's a we're purifier. To, we're, absolutely. We're Living to, water. We are called, well, to test all <laughs> things and hold fast that which is good. Mm -hmm. We're called to test the spirits for many false prophetesses, prophets and prophetesses mm -hmm. have gone abroad. Yes. I mean, this is a warning that we have. So it's a matter, are we testing everything that's being said by the people that you're listening to, mm -hmm. like my own self? Mm -hmm. I've said this a, a, a billion times now. That's a rough estimate. A lot. Don't trust me. Test me. Right. And the only way to test me is not by whether or not you like the way I speak, the way I look, where I come from, the way I dress. Test me according My to the word. word of God. That's the only true measure. Be like the Bereans. Yes. Testing everything. Yes. So spoken. the Lord checks to see if our, tr uh, our purifying and our waste removal systems are functioning properly. Mm -hmm. Ta-da! Spiritual. We are, after all, fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. I mean, all this is with a purpose. And remember that everything that is made in the natural reveals something about the divine nature and purpose of God, mm -hmm. okay? Remember it said, remove the wicked man from among you. And Paul, Paul wrote that in 1 yes. Corinthians. We yes. talked about that last week. You, you will either choose to remove it or you will leave the impurity in. If you tolerate the woman Jezebel, right. then your spiritual kidneys have failed. Kidney failure. Kidney failure. That's death. That, that's a, well, that's not a pleasant thing. I promise you that, right? And that leads to death. And, and leads to death, the yes. human uh, functions. Yes. So, <clears throat> I've often said that the Lord tests the mind to see what we think and searches the heart to see what we believe. This is not new even in the New Testament. The prophet Jeremiah, God spoke through Jeremiah so very long ago, and he said, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind. By the way, in Jeremiah, that word for mind is the Hebrew word kilia, which means kidney. kidney. Even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. So God has always said that, right? When he spoke to the prophet Samuel, he said, you know, I search, man judges by outward appearance, but I search the heart. But he tests the kidneys. Mm -hmm. He tests to see if we are examining, filtering out of our lives that, that does not, which does not belong there, right? right? right. David, listen, David prayed for this. Yes, he did. David prayed, examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and heart. Psalm 26, 2. Okay? Purifying by testing and then taking thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. That's the purifying system. Hallelujah. Yes. Mm. Okay? So cool. <laughs> you better be in the Word and you better be testing things because these are those perilous last days when many false prophets many, have gone aboard. And Jesus said if the time had not been short, cut short, even the elect would be deceived. Right. Satan has had more practice lying than you've had listening to the truth. To but thank God for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth who is sent to lead us into all truth, who will poke you when something's not right. Check that out. Well, pay attention. Yes. And, then, and then, then in this verse he goes on to say, I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. The King James says works, right? Well, that's synonymous? Yes, it is synonymous. Well done. <laughs> works and deeds. They're, they're synonymous. They're the same thing. 
The real question here then is, which is it? Works or faith? There you go. Okay. God here, this is the Lord God Almighty speaking to us. And he says, I'm going to give to each one of you according to your deeds. Well, did something happen here? Did the theology change from the time that, that Paul wrote about salvation being the free gift of God? We receive it by grace through faith, right? Not of works, lest any man should boast. Or is it all of a sudden now God is rewarding us for our deeds, for our works? Our salvation is solely based on faith and not on works. So that, that verse I just quoted, let me read it again. Okay. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest than any man should boast. Mm -hmm. That's clear. That's the Word of God, and it's clear. Yes, it is. Okay? And that salvation is not just, just from salvation from sin. It's salvation from often, I mean, the consequence of sin in our lives. Right, right. Let me just read you some, some verses. I want to talk about faith and works here, right? Jesus said to the centurion, remember when a centurion came to Jesus and said, my servant, my, my son is laying, he's sick, and, and Jesus is like, oh, okay, let's go. And the centurion says, no, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house, but just say the word, and he, because he understood authority. Yes. And remember, Jesus talking about this man's understanding of authority said, he hadn't seen such great faith, faith right? right? But Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have Amen. believed. Matthew 8, 13. And then it talks about when he had healed some blind men, right? He had healed blind men, and it says in Matthew 9, When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, it shall be done to you according to your faith. Ah, faith, yeah. Okay. And again, in Mark 10, there's another occasion. And it's talking about Jesus talking to a, a blind man. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, immediately, he regained his sight and began following him on the road. Mark 10, 51 and 2. Mm. So, so here, it seems to be always about faith, not deeds, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that that's true according to Scripture. So, is there a contradiction here where God says, Now, I'm going to give to you according to your deeds. And the answer is simply no. There's no, no contradiction. There's never a contradiction. Because there. Scripture always interprets Scripture. <clears throat> you see... When God created Adam and made Eve mm -hmm. and put them in the garden, he put them there to cultivate. Right. It's always been about cultivating. It's always been about growing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's always about the fruit, what something brings forth. Yes. Jesus said that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruit. Right? Matthew 7, 19 and 20. Mm -hmm. If your faith does not bear the fruit of action, it will, like a fig tree. Remember that? Let me tell you the story of a fig tree. Let me in, I'll read from Mark 11, right? Okay. When evening came, they would go out of the city, as is Jesus and his disciples, and as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. The fig tree <coughs> was one that, going into the temple that night, Jesus had seen going over to to get fruit from it, even though it wasn't seasoned. Mm -hmm. That's right. And when it bore no fruit to supply him with, he cursed it at the root. Well, you know what? Nobody could see that because it was below the ground, right? That's right. But he cursed it at the root. So they had, now they come by in the morning and they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Mm -hmm. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look. The fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. See, I, now, I can't see your faith. And you can't see my faith. We can sit here all day long and tell each other about, well, we got faith. Well, I know I have faith. It was a gift from God. He gave me a measure of faith. He's given us all a measure of faith. Yes. Her too. Mm -hmm. You too. <laughs> If you are indeed a child of God. That's right. 
that faith is supposed to grow. Mm -hmm. It's about cultivating, yes. right? But you, no matter what you say, you cannot see faith. No. And it's one thing to say, well, I can see the results of faith. No, no. The results of faith are works. That's right, the deeds. Are the deeds. That's right. That great, great faith chapter, Hebrews 11, which we all love so much. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Mm -hmm. It says that by faith, Abel offered. Yes. Abel did something. He yes. gave an offering. Mm -hmm. By faith, Noah prepared an ark. Yes. His faith caused him to, to do, to work, mm -hmm. to build. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Abraham offered up Isaac when he was called by God. Mm -hmm. By faith, Moses refused the riches of Egypt, turned his back on, all the, on the wealth of the world, mm -hmm. and chose rather the sufferings of, to join in with the sufferings of the people of God. Right. So James would say, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead. being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works. I'll show you my faith by my works. James 2, 17 and 18. Faith has to have fruit. And that fruit is the deeds that come, the action that comes, belief. the works that come from that belief that is in our heart. Right, right. Okay? If God is searching the heart, you know, he said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Where is he going to look and how is he going to know? Well, he searches the heart. He can see belief in the heart. Yes, he can. You know, he sees the heart. He searches the heart. I can't. I, I can get a real good idea of what people believe when I sit and have, con have conversations with them. You see, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth speaks mm -hmm. right? Yes. So from what they're saying, I get an idea of what they believe. But better yet, like, like James is saying, I see from their actions what they believe. So you can say all day long, I believe this, I believe that, but if your, if your deeds don't agree, or, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is confirmed. Or you see their reactions to certain yes. trials that they go through. Which God designed yes. to grow our faith that's right. and glorify Him. That's right. right? Well, that's what it is, right? It all just fits together so beautifully. Absolutely. You see, the, the deeds, the works, the actions are not what's rewarded. No, no. It's the faith that brought them into existence that pleased the Lord. Yes. And without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord, right? He deals with things at the root. So the root of your action is the belief in your heart or the lack of belief in your heart. Works that are not brought about by faith, empowered by God's love, profit absolutely nothing. Isn't that what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 13? If I do all of this, but don't have love, right? Nothing. You see, let me go back to something else that Paul wrote in Romans. He said, that for it's not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. That's the word, you know? You hear the word, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word. But if you're not doing the word, you're deceiving yourself. You're self-deceived. You, well, you know what you are? I'll tell you what you are. You're deluded. Because back to James, he said, but prove yourself doers of the words, doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. It made me think about those at the end when... They go before Jesus and say, "Look what I did! Look, Look what, what I, I did!" did. Right. And that, and he was saying, there was no belief, no faith in their heart. No, because they were doing deeds for their own glory. Exactly. I mean, you know, yeah. we talk about this a lot, but it's worthy of being heard many times. It works without faith. These are people, as Alice talking about in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter seven. Jesus said, many will come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord, look what we did in your name. We did all these works, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons. We did all these works in your, in your name, they say. Yeah. And Jesus said, depart from me, you evil ones. I, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Right. Well, you see, because works without that faith, it's coupled with love, which is righteousness. Right, right. Are not from God, and they're not for God's glory. 
How could these people come into the presence of the living, risen Savior face to face and say, look what I did. Mm. I, hey, Lord, did you see what I did? I cast out demons. I, mm -mm. That, that's the epitome of pride. And you know what? God hates pride. It's abominable. It mm. is. All right, zipping right along as we want to do. Yes. In the next verse, uh, verse 24, Revelation 2, 24. Jesus goes on to say in this letter, But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Right. By the way, I want to tell you, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you are weary. Right? Heavy laden. And heavy laden. I will give you rest. Yes. He, he said that his burden was light. Was light. And his yoke was easy. Yes. So, what burden is he putting on us here? The burden is to believe and to act. No that's not a burden. burden, that's a blessing. That's right. So here he says, now remember, this is talking about, we're in this whole section here to the Church of Thyatira, about them tolerating the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. And is teaching this filth to the church. Yes. But they, oh, how, like God said, no, oh, how my people love it so. Right. Because it's justifying the things that they want to do in the flesh, right? Their desires. But the rest are those here, the rest who are in Thyatira, are those, he says, who do not hold to the false teaching. Mm -hmm. They are the remnant. Yes. The Lord... Not his, not, not his brothers, not Joseph's brothers, sent Joseph into Egypt. That's right. Okay? Through the well, through the prison. Through the slavery, yeah. That was God. That's what, you know, when, when he's finally confronted by his brothers, he says, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good, right? But it also says that God sent Joseph into Egypt to preserve a remnant by a great deliverance. It's in, in Genesis 45. Go check it out. To preserve a remnant. Now, a remnant... Is what's left. I'm sure, you know, you probably have a good idea of what a remnant is. I mean, I actually did consulting work in the New York Garment District, District mm -hmm. many years ago. I was a, a business consultant in New York. And in the Garment Center, the, the better the clothing is, uh, patterns match. They they yeah. cu they cut yeah. to make sure that all the patterns in a piece of cloth and a garment match, which means that there's typically a little more waste. Right. Well, those wastes that is remnants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a remnant, and I'm just going to read you from the dictionary. This is from a Random House Dictionary. A remnant is a remaining, usually small part, quantity, number, or the like, a, f a fragment or a scrap. A small, unsold, or unused piece of cloth, lace, etc., at the end of a bolt. A trace, a vestige. Get the idea? Mm -hmm. It's a small part of, of the great big that's left. Okay. The word remnant comes from the old French word, remenoir. How oh, is that? The, the, I sound like Clouseau? Yeah. <laughs> remenoir. Mm -hmm. Meaning, to remain. To, to remain what? I believe that Jesus answered that question a long, long time ago. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved, the one who remains. Right? Mm, the remnant. Now, in these seven letters mm -hmm. to the seven churches, mm -hmm. think about this, right? He says that to me. To the church at Ephesus, he said, you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. They remain. Mm. To the church in Smyrna, he said, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. Remain. To the church at Pergamum, just before Thyatira, he said, you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. They remain. And here, to the church under consideration, Thyatira, he says, what you have Hold fast until I come. Mm. That's in a couple of verses, or next verse up. Remain. It's about remaining. Remaining what? Remaining faithful. Remaining steadfast. Right. Enduring till the end. end. Persevering. That's his remnant. That's the remnant. 
Now, and, and I've said this before, when you talk about persevering, you talk about endurance, you don't mm -hmm. have to endure things that you enjoy, mm -mm. okay? You endure things that you are hard. Yeah, things you don't like. Things you don't like. <clears throat> but you see, this, <clears throat> this is always, from the beginning, been about a remnant, yes. okay? Yes. It's always been about a remnant. Just listen to these verses. I'll give you a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 21 and 22. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. Mm -hmm. Through the prophet Zephaniah, God said, But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies. Hallelujah. Paul, in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 11, says, In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Who? A, whole, a humble and lowly people. Mm. Just talked a minute ago about pride. That's right. Be on guard against pride. Pride is insidious. It will always be poking at you. It will always be pushing at you. It will always be trying you. To rise up. Rise up. You know, I, I've always gotten... I, I don't remember how long ago I noticed this, but it was a long time ago. And, and it's always kind of fascinated me. You see, as, you know, when Paul was on a mission journey, and he'd gone through uh, Asia... He'd go to Thessalonica, and when he got to Thessalonica, he had a, you know, I don't know if you know this, he was there, I think, three weeks, and he had to kind of scoot for his life. Uh, and he went to Berea, right, from there, and from Berea where he found... Uh, Bereans. <laughs> yes, he found Bereans in Berea. How about that? But he found them to be noble-minded because they, rather than react the way they did in Thessalonica, they tested what he said against the word, right? They were receptive to, be, they tested it. From there, he went on to Athens. And in Athens, he was there waiting for, for Timothy and Silas to come to him. Mm -hmm. So he did what Paul did, what Paul always did. He's preaching the word. He is planting the seed of the word all the time, right? Mm -hmm. He's doing that in the synagogues, it says, and he's doing that in the marketplace. That's what it says in the mm -hmm. book of Acts, right? Mm -hmm. Let me read you what it says in, in Acts 17. I'm going to read Acts 17, 18. So also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Acts 17, 18. Mm -hmm. It fascinates me that this great preacher of the gospel who changed the world would be called by Greek philosophers all right? Wise, learned. Who are still studied today mm -hmm. for their wisdom, mm -hmm. even in some churches. And a lot of some church theology is based on Plato and Aristotle. Oh, right, yes. Instead yes. of on the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's another story. Mm -hmm. But it's true. Mm -hmm. So here they are. They're calling him Paul a babbler, an idle babbler, in this city that is famed for its intellectual debate and philosophy. It's open to hear anything, right, right? right? A city that was the birthplace of Socrates, it was the home of Plato's Academia and Aristotle's Lyceum. Mm. What's really interesting is that they actually called him was a spermologos. 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 Now, maybe my pronunciation of the Greek isn't uh, what, what you'd like, but that's what it says, right? It's translated, either, uh, it's a babbler in the King James, idle babbler in the New American Standard. But it was basically Greek slang for a bird who would pick up whatever seeds were left behind, hadn't taken root and, and grown. You know, the seed was, seed was laying on the ground, so a, a, a leftover seed, and a bird would come along and pick it up. But it was applied as a slang, as a derogatory slang towards... Explain it when we, we talked about this earlier about with, uh, with people when they talk about money and they call it bread. Oh, yeah, okay. It's, it's an idiom or slang. Yeah. Uh, Alice is mentioning, I was talking about this and I said, well, it's like in America, 
And here in the UK, from what I understand, we use, I don't know if it's as common anymore, but this, mm -hmm. this, the term bread for money. Mm -hmm. So if I, I said to Alice, you know, you got any bread? And, and she would know in the context that I was talking about money. Mm -hmm. But bread it's doesn't money. mean no. m money. Mm -hmm. And idioms and slang don't change the fact that what the word means mm -hmm. is something different. Right. All right? So here these Greeks, these wise men, these philosophers of Greek, Greece, in their pride, they would apply this word, all right, spermologos, to, I don't know any other way to say it, it's like a bum. You know, you've seen derelicts and, and homeless people, they may walk around, they'll go into bins, into garbage cans, and, and be looking through them to pick out anything that they think that they can mm -hmm. use. What is, what is the spermologos? I'm going to get to that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Or you may have seen, I mean, this is not uncommon where I've been, you know, people go around, people who are homeless, street people we call them, they'll go around and they'll gather tin cans and bottles and then take them and try and get some money for them. They're picking up the leftovers, the remnants, right? Right. So basically, even though they're, they're using a slang term to put Paul down. As a derelict. As a derelict. You know, useless. Yeah. A bum. Right? <coughs> Spermologos. Let, let's, let's look at that for just a second in the Greek. You know what a sperm is? Mm -hmm. It's a seed right. that gives life. Logos. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was made flesh. The Word dwelt among us. The Word through whom all things came. The Word, the Word, the Word. Logos. That's the Greek word, Logos. Yes. Seed and Word. The ministry that God had called Paul to was to plant the seed of the word throughout the Roman world. But he was a remnant gatherer. Yes. They were right. <laughs> because God had sent him out to gather up the remnant. Yes. It fascinates me mm -hmm. that these wise people could in their foolishness say something that had a truth that was so far beyond them that they couldn't begin to comprehend it. You know, Paul said that the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are spiritually appraised. Yes. These brilliant scholars of Greece couldn't spiritually appraise and yet it was like God forced the truth to come forth from their mouths. Paul was a spermologos. He was always planting the seed of the Word. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, I, when Alice and I lived in the bush in Central America, um, as we'd come from our camp and be going into the city, we might take mm -hmm. what garbage we had accumulated, and along the road there was a dump, which was burning <coughs> seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It burned from the day we got there to the day we left. It's still burning. It's probably still, still burning, mm -hmm. yeah. And so we would go and we'd, we'd toss, you know, our, our garbage into that pile. Yes, yeah. And you'd see people come running out of the woods to check it out, check it out see if there was anything that they could use. <coughs> there were remnant gatherers. Mm. God is looking with a greater hunger for those people who are his remnant. Yes. And no matter where you go, even if you go on to the dump, mm. I promise you that the hand of God will pick you up and search through you, dust you off, pretty you up, mm. to make you a part of that remnant. Let me just say what I said before. In their witty criticism of Paul, mm. okay, these wise men were stating a joyous and magnificent truth. truth. Yes. <laughs> Paul had a ministry given him by the Almighty mm -hmm. God to be a remnant gatherer. And Paul would say of those famed Greek philosophers, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. And then he continues on to say, to proclaim, not to babble, 
But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are not which are strong. 1 Corinthians 1, down in verse 27. You ought to be rejoicing at that. Because if you're like me, and if you are one of those ones that God is looking for, the lowly and humble, you know that you don't, you're not getting anything from God because you deserve it. It's because of the grace of God. It's because His Son purchased it for you at such a dear cost. Okay. All right. So then in that, in that verse continues on to talk about the people who do not hold to this teaching. What teaching? The teaching of Jezebel, right? Yes. Alice mentioned the, the, the Berea, and I did. So let's just, it says in Acts 17, 11, Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Acts 17, 11. You know, if you, if you are joining us for this Bible study, I pray mm -hmm. to God. That you will do exactly that. That you will examine the scriptures to see if what we've talked about here is so. Amen. Because, and I'll say this, you know, I may say this every Bible study. God has called me to teach the Word. To take it from my mouth to your mind. It goes into your ears. You know, God gave you five senses. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And it goes to your brain. Bada bing, bada boom. And you are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But the simple truth is, it says, with the heart man believes. So somehow, that word that goes into your brain, whether it's from hearing me speak it or somebody else speak it, or from what you, it has to go from your head to your heart. And that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Only the Holy Spirit can take what you're hearing and move it to real belief in your heart where it becomes the core of your being. Mm. And it affects every deed, every work, every action that you take in life. So pray. Test this. Don't, don't leave this Bible study when you leave this Bible study. Mm. We had a dear brother who's just going on to be with the Lord, Arthur Burt. And he was 102 years old. And Arthur always used to say, we have these gatherings, and Arthur would say, well, a meeting doesn't start until a meeting ends. That's right. And people say, what? what? <laughs> but he had it so right. That's right. This study doesn't begin until this study ends. That's right. Until you until get together you. with the Lord, until you meditate on His Word, until you converse with Him, the living God who Amen. is there, who is near, His ear is not deaf. No dull and his arm is not short and when you talk to the Lord and when you let that Holy Spirit within you move mm. those words down into your heart and you begin to confess them with your mouth mm. you will begin to yeah. act on them yes and you will begin to live like Paul did walking always in the triumph of Christ Jesus that's taking What's in your mind, and it's it's a treasure, and it putting is. it in oh, your heart. It treasure what we treasure in our hearts. It, it is. It is a treasure. Amen. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Well, I mentioned many times. I think I mentioned just a moment ago. You know, because it's it's so so important in this study, right? That we examine everything that's taught. Mm -hmm. It says, but false prophets arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the master who brought bought them bringing swift destruction upon themselves second peter 2 1 so peter is writing this letter two thousand years ago and he's saying this is the way it is now but you want to know something just as it will be false teachers and if you don't believe that it will be go read what jesus said in matthew 24 talking about the last days specifically yes. He talks about how much false teaching there will be, right? And the teachers who are doing that teaching, those teachers are cautioned. All teachers are cautioned. Yes. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, mm -hmm. knowing that as such we incur a stricter judgment. James 3.1 So remember the Lord's commendation to the church at Ephesus because they cannot tolerate evil men. 
and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles. Back in, in chapter, this chapter, verse 2. We got to do that. We got to put to the test those who call themselves apostles and see if it's so. You got to test the spirits for many false prophets are going to ruin. And you know what's going to happen? The devil is going to rise up. And the devil may take form of that nice little old lady sitting next to you. That devil may take the form of who you are. But that devil will rise up and say, Oh, don't be George Mantle. There you go. Sounds nice. Don't be George Mantle. You better get Judge Mantle when it comes to the people of God Amen. to test him. And pastors, I tell you, you better get so you can discern and tell when one of those sheep out there is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Right. And you better bonk him on the head. Get him out of there. Get him out. <laughs> Remove, we talk about this? Right. Remove that evil that from your midst. That, one from, that evil one from your midst. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay. okay. Okay, let me continue on for a minute. Oh, I, do I have time to continue on? <laughs> And it goes on in that verse to say, who have not known the deep things of Satan. I don't know if I can do this very quickly, right? You see, we are to be aware of the schemes, of the, the wiles mm -hmm. of the devil. Yes. As a matter of fact, that's a book that I'm writing near completion called The Schemes of the Devil and the Triumph of Christ, of Christ Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. So we're just, we are to know the schemes. But that's not... That's not what it's talking about here, the deep things of the devil, right? That's what they call them, the they. Who's the they? The ones who are receiving the false teaching, mm -hmm. right? What we're supposed to know, not the deep things of Satan, we're supposed to know the depths of God. That's right. Listen to this. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, Amen. even the depths of God. Amen. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 10. Yes. We're supposed to know the deep things of God. You know, a, a case in point is this very book that we're studying, the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. If you look at the world, they talk about the book of Revelation, and it's always a focus on the devil. Yes. Mark of the beast. Yeah, it's always, really. I mean, think about it. Think about the movies, the books, all that stuff. It's always a focus on the devil. Mm. No, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. It's not just from Him. No. It's about Him. That's right. This is, a, this is a focus on Jesus Christ. This is prophecy. Yes, but you know what? It says, for, the, for the, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It says that in Revelation 19. Yes. So, we got to get focused on Jesus Christ. All right? Don't take your eyes. Don't look for the deep things of Satan. Mm -hmm. Find the depths of God. Amen. All right? Amen. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and he said, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet mm -hmm. able. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2. All too many Christians have not achieved any maturity in their walk with the Lord. They hadn't. Right? No. <clears throat> That's a church that Paul started. God used him to, find, to start that church. God used He was the first pastor of that church. Paul stayed there and taught. And yet he's saying, you know, you haven't matured. You're still babes in Christ. I can't give you the solid food, right? You still want the milk. Yeah. Too many Christians are still immature, no matter how long they've been saved. Because you see, maturity is not about age. Well, we're going to talk about what it is about then, all right? But I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to end on this, all right? Because this is too important a subject to cut short. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 6. We need to press on to maturity. So the next part of this study, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what, what does maturity mean? I bet if you ask 10 people what maturity is, you'll get 11 different answers. First one would probably be old. Old, yeah, well, I know a lot of old, uh, very immature people. That's right. Uh, at times I can be one of those. Well, no, I'm going to, I am. No, you're not going to. I am not. That. You are not. Even though I'm a child of God. That's right. You're I am a man, man of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> okay. But we want to talk about what maturity actually is, mm -hmm. where it comes from, okay. and how we can strive for it. Yes. And by strive, I don't mean, I, I mean it should be something that we seek. You want to grow. It's always about growth. God is changing you. If you're listening to this Bible study, it's for one reason and one reason truly mm -hmm. only, for God to change you. Amen. The reason I'm doing this Bible study is for God to change me Amen. and Alice. Amen. You see, it's a process of change because His promise is to bring us from glory to glory. And the purpose is because it says, whom He foreknew, He predestined yes. to be conformed yes. into the image of His Son, Christ Jesus. Change my heart, O oh God. I, I, I'm going to just say this because uh, if you've been following the Bible studies or us on Bible Talk, you know I just turned 71 years old. Mm -hmm. And I received a compliment the other day. Somebody said to me, well, you don't look like it. And I said, well, that's because I had work done. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I had work done. Yeah, the see, potter. The potter. I'm just a clay. And he's constantly cutting and shaping and molding. And <laughs> I have work done because I need it. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Go, go have some work done. Amen. So you have that joy, that childlike joy. Go have a talk go, with the potter. Go have a talk <laughs> with the potter. Let him do some work on you. Hallelujah. Oh, it's yes. about change. Yes. And that change is growth because the calling of God is an upward calling. He has cultivated us mm -hmm. from the root. And the root is our spirit within yes. us. His spirit within us. And he is growing something glorious and beautiful. He's growing Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ in us. He's forming him into us. Forming yes. Jesus yes. in us. So, so mm. desire to mature, desire to grow, desire to change. And remember, the thing that will do it is the Word of God. Amen. Yes. Wielded by the Holy Spirit. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Lord, that you love us so much. Mm. That you will constantly work on us. That you love us so much. Don't give up on us. That you are molding and shaping us all the time to bring us, to conform us into the image of His Son, Christ Jesus. Lord, that you can, you can wash away the stain of every sin when we come to you with repentance. Lord, you talk here about the lowly and the humble. That's our desire, is that you would receive all the glory. That we would say like John the Baptist, you must increase, but I must decrease. That we would have a heart that cries out like your son Jesus did, Father. Not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, let our lives be all about you. We just praise you and thank you for what you're doing and what you've done in our lives. What you're doing in our lives and what you are yet to do in our lives. We praise you and bless your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, as always, it's been good to spend a little time with you. Wonderful to be in the Word. And by the way, you know, why, why not drop us a little line? Let us know where you're watching from. And if you have any questions or comments or suggestions, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. But until we do, I know that my sweet patootie over here, Alice, wants to let you know... Jesus loves you. A lot. Thank God you. bless you and goodbye till next time. See you then. Bye.